Hello, everyone. My name is Robert Marcel, and I'm one of two historians serving the Air Force Lifecycle Management Center. Today, we're continuing a video series we've partnered with AFL-CMC's Public Affairs Office to produce, which we're calling Out of the Hangar. PA's producer, Joe, is also here with us today. Hey, Joe. Hey, Robert. Hey, everybody else. Great to see you again. So with today's episode, I wanted to elaborate on one of the newsletter stories we briefly covered back in May, the 80th anniversary of the completion of the Chengdu Project, a World War II effort to rapidly construct by hand several austere airfields in western China in support of Operation Matterhorn. The reason the Chengdu Project is important to us today is due to its tie-ins with some of our present-day efforts in the Air Force particularly with regards to Secretary Kendall's operational imperatives and specifically to operational imperative or OI number five on resilient basing. Put succinctly, OI five has two aspects to it, improving our agility and flexibility in where we can operate our forces instead of relying on uncontested air spaces like we've been doing in the decades since the end of the Cold War and in preparing and training to operate from austere and atypical locations to enhance the survivability of our forces. Both of these aspects tie into our story about Project Chengdu. First, set the stage. We're talking World War II and the war in the Pacific in particular. Japan began its military expansion, as you can see on the map here in the Pacific, as early as the 1890s with the first Sino-Japanese War in 1894. Annex Korea in 1910 invaded the Chinese province of Manchuria in 1931, and in 1937 began invading the rest of China. Japan additionally took many islands in the Pacific as well as several other territories, but in the interest of time, we won't delve too deeply into those details today. The main point right now is that when the US became involved in the fighting at the end of 1941 after Pearl Harbor, the Japanese home islands were largely unassailable to us. The territories in which the Japan Japanese empire had expanded provided them a buffer against our forces as none of our airplanes had a wide enough range to hit them at home from our existing air bases. Now, even before Pearl Harbor and our formal entry into the war against Japan, the U.S. had started to become involved in the Pacific in more subtle ways. First, with economic aid to the Republic of China, our ally in the region, and then with military aid. Perhaps most famously, in April 1941, future Major General Claire Lee Chenault, Chenault rather, pictured here, an American aviator and a brilliant fighter pilot tactician began recruiting American pilots and maintenance crews with assistance from the U.S. government to form the American Volunteer Group, a group of American fighter pilots who would fly for the Chinese leader, Chiang Kai-shek, and the Chinese Air Force. Early on in the American Volunteers Group's highly successful operations in China, Chinese media gave the small group of American fighters a new name, a name by which they'd be known throughout the rest of the war the Flying Tigers, and in 1942, they were officially brought into the United States Army Air Forces. But again, this is all just to set the stage for what we really want to talk about today, the Chengdu Project. The Chengdu Project was a component of the wider Operation Matterhorn, an extremely ambitious plan to use our then brand new B-29 Super Fortresses to conduct strategic bombing against the Japanese home islands from forward bases in western China. The B-29 Super Fortress had its first flight in September of 1942, and in 1943, the U.S. Army Air Forces began receiving the first operational B-29s. These airplanes were designed to be game changers. They could fly further, faster, and higher than existing bombers. They could carry far more bombs than their nearest siblings, and they even had pressurized cabins, greatly increasing the comfort of the crews. They also, of course, are the only aircraft to have ever dropped nuclear bombs in war. But design and production problems stalled their initial use, and it wasn't until the fall of 1943 that Army Air Force's planners could begin hatching Operation Matterhorn. At this point in the war, we hadn't hit Japan with bombs since Jimmy Doolittle's famous 1942 raid, which was itself just a one-off attack that did no significant strategic damage. But now in late 1943, with the B-29 in our pockets, we finally saw a way to really hit home at the Empire. Operation Matterhorn's basic plan was to establish our new B-29s in India with forward staging bases for them in China for strategic air raids against Japan. 
China at the time was the closest allied area from which we could hit the islands, as we did not yet control the Mariana Islands, which is where our B-29s would largely base from after Matterhorn, and the Soviet Union would not allow us to construct airfields in Siberia. Now, initially, there was some pushback against Matterhorn. It was already a significant logistical challenge to supply the China-Burma-India theater, and Matterhorn would only make the supply lines worse. But ultimately, idea prevailed partly because uh, President Roosevelt saw Matterhorn as a means to encourage the beleaguered Chinese forces, keeping them in the fight. Matterhorn was given to the 20th Bomber Command, which was organized in late 1943 under the leadership of Brigadier General, later Lieutenant General, Kenneth B. Wolfe. And construction was started in India, where the focus was placed on converting existing airfields into airfields that could be used by B-29. Even as the airfields were being made ready in India, work was also underway on the forward bases around Chengdu, which is in China's Sichuan province. The Chengdu area was chosen because it was only a couple hundred miles from the Chinese capital at the time, and because it was far enough back from Japanese lines to not risk immediate detection and attack. It was almost 2,000 miles away from its targets in southern Japan, however, which put it just inside the B-29's maximum range for takeoff, bomb drop, and return. Between January and May 1944, four B-29 bases were established by Project Chengdu. Six fighter fields were also built, with a seventh hosted at one of the bomber bases to defend the superfortresses. The fighters were under the command of General Chennault. As noted briefly in our intro, these airfields were all created using manual labor and hand tools. The Japanese blockade of China was so complete that heavy machinery could not be brought in by road or by sea. Even the fuel for the B-29s themselves had to be flown over the treacherous Himalayas, which was called flying the hump. In any case, between 300,000 and 500,000 Chinese laborers would ultimately find themselves working on these airfields. They utilized basic tools like the nearly 11,000 pound stone roller pictured here at the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force. Excavation was done by hose. Rocks were carried from nearby streams in buckets, baskets, and wheelbarrows, as seen here, and stones were laid individually by hand. This massive human effort is what made the Chengdu project successful. The workers themselves were barely paid enough to afford food, but they worked hard nonetheless, and American observers in the press were awed by their ability to produce these airfields by hand, making frequent comparisons to the building of the Great Wall of China or the pyramids. Unfortunately, Matterhorn itself wasn't as successful as its workers. Logistical struggles made the whole thing extremely expensive and difficult, and when planes did make it to Japan, the jet stream over the Japanese home islands made high-altitude bombing extremely inaccurate. On the first raid against Japan's home islands from the Chinese air bases on June 15, 1944, only a single bomb from a single B-29 actually hit its target. Cap Arnold, overall commander of the Army Air Forces, relieved Wolf of his command less than a month later, on the 4th of July, no less, to bring in Major General Curtis LeMay. Wolf would actually come here to Wright Patterson Air Force Base, then Wright Field, after that, but that's a story for another day. Bombing results improved under LeMay, who changed tactics from the high altitude explosive bombing techniques that Wolf was using, which had worked well in Europe, but were, as noted, frustrated here by the jet stream's impact on B-29 accuracy and by Japanese construction methods to low-altitude incendiary bombing, but logistics remained a critical issue. When the Mariana Islands were captured and B-29s began being stationed there beginning in October 1944, it was clear that Matterhorn's days were numbered. Even with LeMay and the 20th Bomber Command producing better results from China than the 21st Bomber Command was initially managing from the Marianas, the Joint Chiefs of Staff ultimately decided to pull the 20th Bomber Command out of China in January of 1945, redirecting most of the B-29 fleet to the Mariana Islands. Uh, The last B-29 mission was flown from China against targets in Formosa, modern-day Taiwan, on January 15, 1945. The May, however, took leadership of the 21st Bomber Command just five days later, later, and on uh, January 20th, and ultimately would see enormous operational success with his low-altitude incendiary bombing against Japan from this location. It should perhaps be noted, though, that while the B-29 
bombing campaigns hastened the end of the war, there were significant human costs associated with their use. In concluding, Matterhorn operations were costly and did not produce major strategic victories, but they did allow the U.S. to begin striking Japan at home nearly half a year earlier than we otherwise would have been able to, which helped to shake Japanese resolve and probably contributed to keeping China in the war. Moreover, it demonstrated the ability of the United States and its allies to quickly construct and make operational dispersed forward operating bases for then brand new heavy aircraft in very short order using the most basic of tools. It's an idea that we revisit today in the face of potential new threats with OI-5 and agile combat employment. Project Shengdu shows that the ideas that we are exploring today were possible for us in 1944. And if there's a need and the will, they are also possible for us today. And that's all I have for you, Joe. Robert, thank you so much. I, you know, I hear these names or you hear these names, but you don't always know the through line and how they connect or and they interconnect with each other in history. Um, it's also great, like you've said, just to, to, to realize that, you know, there are, are these historical precedents that, you know, really can inform what, what the mission is today. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you, Robert. I really appreciate it. And I, I'm glad, so glad that you could speak with us and everybody else could, uh, could join us today. Mike Rice. Thank you, Joe. And thank you everybody for paying attention. <laughs>